Welcome, thanks for coming in. My name is Kevin Williams. I work in the Rick Steves Travel Center. We focus on helping independent travelers, mostly in my department. But with this job, I get the perk of traveling a lot, which I get to explore new areas. And one of my new favorite destinations is Iceland and the Reykjavik area. So we're gonna take a look at some of the things you can do there. Iceland is a decent sized country. If you wanted to do the whole country for a tour, I would say you need at least seven full days. But this class will focus on what most travelers are doing, and that is spending time around Reykjavik. You can see in that area, Keflavik Airport is where you'll come in. You can see near there is the Blue Lagoon, which we'll talk about more later. Golden Circle is one of the more popular tours where you see a lot of great natural beauty. And there's a few other things, glacier hikes, Icelandic courses, We'll take a look at those a little bit closer. I'm sure many of you are noticing Iceland Air, big player on getting North Americans to Europe. And I like this map from Iceland Air that highlights all the North American cities that also get connected with Europe. Iceland Air has done a great job of competing with the big name airlines and then having you land in Reykjavik. Sometimes it's a quick turnaround, maybe 35 minutes just in and out. But other times, I think they purposely give you a long layover so that you start debating, do I want to spend a night in Iceland? Do I want to spend two nights in Iceland? They will even give you seven days in Iceland for no extra charge, meaning if you saw one airfare that's cheaper than spending seven days, you just call Iceland Air and say, hey, if I do just a quick turnaround, it's X amount, but if I want to stay seven extra days. Will you match that? They'll say yes. Basically, Iceland's government and Iceland Air are working together to bring in tourism. They had a bit of an economic issue a few years ago. I don't know if people remember. And they really started pushing for tourism. And just this year, tourism has become their number one industry. In 2015, they had roughly two million travelers come through. So it's definitely an up and coming destination and with good reason. One of the big fascinating things about Iceland is where it's located. You'll see on this map the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, which is what's separating basically Europe and North America. But as it runs up north, it cuts right through Iceland, meaning there are some geographical features and geological features that are very different from anywhere else. It also technically means that part of it is in North America and part of it is in Europe, but culturally and it just has a bigger connection to Europe, of course. But if you do want to get technical, Reykjavik is kind of in North America. <laughs> <laughs> and because of that, there are volcanoes. People may remember this volcano that, as much as I practice, I cannot say for the life of me. But it erupted and made travel to Europe a little tricky. And so you always have to be prepared for this to happen. But Iceland has lived with these for decades, centuries, etc., that they know not to build in the places where it's going to be a problem. <laughs> I like to just sum up Iceland fairly quick with their history and culture. And the best way to describe Iceland's history is it was accidentally discovered a few times. But this gentleman, Floki, a Viking, he gave it the name Iceland when he saw big sheets of ice floating through one of the harbors as he came in. And so that name kind of stuck as it traveled through the different Viking clans and Scandinavian areas. Fast forward a little bit, you have Inglefor. He was a Norwegian chieftain who, in a nice way, was banished, basically. As it was harder to find land in Scandinavia, more and more chieftains, younger or children of chieftains, had to find places to go. So he sailed off with some of his clansmen towards Iceland. And he was going to be the first person to try and settle there. And believing in their gods and their culture, he had two ornate carved pillars that he said, I'm going to take these pillars, throw them off my boat, and wherever I find them on the shore, that is where I'm going to settle. Because that's a great way to pick where you're going to settle. <laughs> it luckily worked out for him. He found them where Reykjavik now is. And Reykjavik actually means the cove of smoke, because they saw the smoke coming off the thermal vents behind some of the mountains there. But it was a great location for them. You got the first settlement starting there. As People were hearing that these original Reyka Vikings were doing all right. More and more people started coming to Iceland from the Scandinavian countries. 
Eventually, there was enough that they had to set up what was called the All Thing. And this was basically a council of elders and chieftains who would meet once a year. And they'd meet at the All Thing, uh, the Thingiver, All Thing Thingiver, which is where once a year they'd meet. It's also part of the Golden Circle, so you'll have a chance to see it if you do that tour. But they would discuss the rules for the upcoming year. They would discuss any issues they have, whether someone from another clan was caught stealing from another clan, how he should be punished. It was a good way to keep peace and order in Iceland. As more people went there, and as a lot of the Scandinavian countries became more kingdoms, Iceland transitioned between Norway and Denmark. They had control at different times, and eventually, World War II happened. When World War II happened, when Germany took over Denmark, who at that time was in control of Iceland, Denmark lost contact with Iceland. And so they first declared they're going to be an independent country. They were just going to stay neutral in the war. When they declared their neutrality, Britain saw that they were in a great position, and the British invaded. <laughs> now, the word invasion is a little strong, although that is what they call it. Basically, the British showed up, and the governor in charge of Iceland said, these are our allies, you know, just let them walk on our shore, that sort of attitude about it happening. But it did set up a great blockade for any sort of German boats trying to go north. When the United States entered the war, we were handed control of Iceland, and it made a great place to get a lot of our material, especially aircraft, over to the European front. Because at that time, it was pretty tricky for our aircraft to cross the Atlantic. So they could stop here on the way and continue on. In Keflavik Airport, that we'll talk about later, that was a United States Air Force base originally. That's now been turned into their main international airport. After World War II, though, they declared they're going to stay independent and became their own nation. And so that is really the, the birth of the Iceland we see today. Culturally, again, they are Scandinavian, and they have deep national pride. For a country that's about 300,000 people, which is about half the size of a mid-sized US city, they are on the world market, they're big on tourism, even their sports teams qualify for huge events. So they have lots of things to be proud for, especially for the size of their nation. Icelanders, in a nutshell, most of them are Scandinavian heritage of some kind, usually Norwegian or Danish. You can see Rick with his Norwegian heritage fits right in there. They also have a strong belief and connection with their folklore. They have a lot of tales of trolls and elves, uh, either messing with people, playing pranks, even sometimes a little bit more sinister. But it is fun to see with their sculptures and just the stories they can tell, how deeply rooted they are to this folklore. One example I like to show is whenever you see big rocks like this, don't be surprised if you see the road go around the rock. And I was told that it's because this is where elves live. And they deeply believe that if you mess with their house, you're going to have a life of hardship because the elves are going to fight back. They're going to make you regret that you touched their home. So if you are renting a car and driving, just keep your eye out for these fun times. They're like, why didn't the road go straight? Oh, that giant rock right there. <laughs> the language is the closest to the original Viking language. This happens a lot with linguistics. When a culture is isolated, it tends to hold on to the tradition a little bit more. So Norwegian, Swedish, or and Danish, they kind of evolved a bit more than Icelandic did. Another fun fact is Tolkien, who wrote Lord of the Rings, he was fluent in Icelandic. And he used a lot of that language to base some of the Elvish words and styles. So if you speak Elvish, there is a good chance you'll know some words. <laughs> the language has shifted a little bit to be closer to the Latin style alphabet. I will tell you when you see these signs, read it as close as you can. I've tried practicing Icelandic pronunciations and I can't do it. It is a difficult language. And it's actually fun to do this with Icelandic people. If you have a chance to chat either with your guide, people at a bar or restaurant, they do get a little enjoyment hearing English speakers attempt to say their words. They're not making fun of you. You don't have to get shy about it. But it is kind of entertaining to do your best to try and sound it out. And then they'll say it really fast. You know, huh? What? So 
do your best to read the letters you know, and if you see the symbol that you're not entirely sure what it is, just kind of make a, a muffled sound and you'll probably do okay. <laughs> <laughs> the way they do their last name is a little different. We're more used to a family name that carries on. But the way Ice, Icelanders do their last name is you take your father's first name and add son to it. <laughs> or if you're a girl, you add daughter. So the example I would give, my father is Kenneth. I would be Kevin Kenneth's son if I was in Iceland. I was also told that sometimes you do take your mother's first name, but that was if your father was a criminal or very just, just an awful person is kind of the best way she explained it. So most of the time it is your father's name. This also makes it hard to know who is connected by relation. But the joke that I constantly heard there is, eh, we're all related at some point. So it is a pretty small island. <laughs> The food is pretty hearty. If you're a vegetarian, you will have problems eating <laughs> traditional Icelandic food. They do have restaurants of other cultures, so you'll find food, but a lot of red meat, especially sheep, that's the base of that, and then a lot of fish. They're closely connected to the ocean. I think fishing is what kept them alive for the centuries, because there is a lot of great seafood that goes through there. Showing that connection also is on their money. All their coins have some sort of sea creature on it. And currently, the Icelandic krona is about 130 to $1. I personally like to look at these giant bills and pretend I'm rich, <laughs> but then come back to real life and then decide that I think 100 to 1 is a little easier to, to figure out prices. So you can take these bills and just add a decimal up two spots. And then you can get an idea of kind of what it is. If you're paying for something and your conversion of 100 to 1 seems OK, then you can definitely purchase it, knowing that it's actually even a little bit cheaper. Unlike a lot of Europe, you may have heard about the chip and pin card issues. Yeah, long story short, Europe likes the chip and pin. We're slowly getting the chip in our cards. We're still traditional magnetic swipe. Iceland's a little different. They've been prepared for the magnetic swipe and the chip and pin everywhere. And to be honest, they are a country that loves plastic. Even when I buy a cup of coffee, they seemed a little surprised that I was using cash rather than just running my credit card. So you'll have no problems using a credit card while in Iceland. In fact, it's probably preferred by a lot of them. <laughs> and on the subject of coffee, they are a coffee-loving nation. It kind of makes sense when half your year is pretty dark that you probably need coffee to wake you up. Now, I do recommend filling up on coffee here, especially if you're going to England, if you're going to northern Germany. Just some parts of Europe, they love Nescafe. So if you're a true tr coffee drinker, get it now, because you'll regret it if you get it in England. Get the tea there instead. Germany, get the beer. You'll be happier. <laughs> if you're going to Italy, you're probably fine. They do pretty good coffee. <laughs> I do recommend wearing your money belt or security item, especially in the summer in Reykjavik. As it's grown in popularity with tourists, the traveling pickpockets have also started traveling there. So it's not Icelandic people who are probably picking your pocket. It is people traveling there knowing that there's tourists there. So it's good practice to get used to your money belt, keep your passport, your credit cards, and your large amounts of cash safe in that money belt or neck wallet. So diving into it, you're going to be landing at Keflavik. Keflavik is a good distance outside of Reykjavik. So just keep in mind, it's going to be about a 45 minute trip between A and B. There is a bus that can connect you that runs very often. It waits basically for every flight to make it easy for travelers. You can also rent cars here and explore that way if you'd like. If you decide to do the driving route, it's not too difficult in Iceland. They also drive on the same side as us here in the United States. But you may be surprised how many dirt roads there are. Even what seems like a main highway is a good chance it's a dirt road. But it's a little different than what we have, or at least what I'm used to in the United States. It's well maintained. And the big reason for this is in the winter, when it gets icy, it's better to have it dirt road because pavement tends to crack and break. And it would just be a lot more work to maintain that. But on these roads, you still can easily go about 50 kilometers an hour, which is pretty good speed. Here's that example of how quickly it can change on you. So pay attention. Again, driving isn't too bad. When you're out on the country roads, you'll probably be the only car within miles. 
there's a good chance you won't see another car for 20 minutes. If you're doing the golden circle loop, that's a little bit different, especially in the summer. Quite a few people will be on the road with you too. But it's very easy to just disappear in Iceland. <laughs> Take one turn and you're in the middle of this great valley all by yourself. Here are some of the, the vistas you'll get as you drive. So even in the winter, you can see Iceland is a little bit warmer than a lot of people think. It has the Gulf Stream that comes up and keeps it surprisingly warm in the winter and a bit cold in the summer. So I would recommend, even on a summer trip though, layer up. Bring a sweater or a sweatshirt and a waterproof coat because the Arctic weather can change drastically. And if the wind picks up, even in July, it can turn to minus 30 degrees on a fly. When I first went, it was November. And during the day, when I had about five hours of sunlight, the day was about 38 degrees. Not that bad. But it, once the sun went down, it did drop down to 20 or lower pretty quick. So it can get cold at night. If you're going in the summer, you get the joys of almost 24 hours of sunlight. So you can get a lot done during the day. And I would say a high temperature for Iceland is probably about 75 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's never going to get too hot. It's more of a reason to always make sure you have something to keep you warm just in case. Buses can get you everywhere if you don't feel like driving. The Icelandic Tourist Board, Iceland Air, other tourist companies are doing an excellent job about making sure you can get to where you want to go. So if you don't want to drive, don't feel like you have to. You can get on one of these bus tours and do the Golden Circle. You can go do glacier hikes. You can go to the Blue Lagoon. And you can see from this bus, there are special buses made to survive the terrain. If the bus has to go off road for a little bit, it can survive it pretty easy. What I would recommend if you are doing about the 48 hours like most travelers is give a full day to Reykjavik. You'll be able to see and do a lot in about 24 hours there. The other day, I would pick one of the day tour ideas or one of the outside of Reykjavik ideas. And if you have more time, even better. You can add more. But from here, you can see Reykjavik is not a huge city, even though it is the biggest city in all of Iceland at about 200,000 people. It feels like you're in a small town. It's also the most northern capital in the world, so they like to boast that quite a bit. But as you walk around, You'll see this on the peninsula, that it's isolated here. And this is technically the main area of Reykjavik. But what you'll probably focus on is on that red square. And this is where all the old city sites are, most of the museums, and it's all very walkable. You do not need a car for just visiting Reykjavik. But if you have one, it's probably the easiest city to find parking, in my opinion. Of course, when you get to the main streets, it gets a little bit harder but it is not difficult to go a block or two and find parking. When you walk around, you're going to see a lot of murals. They have a lot of art just everywhere in Reykjavik. I think this comes down to, again, half the year it's dark. What can you do? Let's try and brighten it up with murals, bright colored houses. And so again, you walk around, you just go a block off one of the main shopping streets, and there you are in what feels like a residential area. So it's the biggest little city I think I've been to. <laughs> This is one of the main streets. You'll find most of the restaurants, bars, souvenir shops, tourist information offices on two streets. I am awful at pronouncing these two streets, but there is Lagagavr, and then the next one, I don't even get close, so I've dubbed it Skull Street. And most <laughs> Icelandic people knew what I was referring to when I just said Skull Street. But Lagagavr has most of those restaurants and bars. Skull has a few more of the shops, but it leads right up to the biggest icon, Hallgrim's Kirka. So this is the big church cathedral of Reykjavik. It is not old by any means compared to other sites in Europe. It was finished in the 1960s. It even has an elevator that lets you go up to the top, so you don't even have to worry about the 300 plus stairs that you might be thinking you need to climb. It's a statue of Leif Erikson in the front there. When you go inside, you'll see it's pretty simple, pretty minimalist. But this is where they do have their big state functions, whether it's a funeral of a statesman, big holiday celebrations at Christmas time. But you'll again, you'll see it's going to tower over everything else in the city. So if you're out in the water, you can use that as a great focal point to know where you are within Reykjavik. Once you decide to go up to the tower, which I highly recommend, it doesn't cost much at all. 
you can go up the elevator and you get some of the best views in all of Reykjavik, if not the best views in all of Reykjavik. Again, you get to see how it's a small town right in front of you, but if you just look out another direction, you'll see how quickly it turns into almost a, a wasteland. <laughs> but again, it's just that, it's the beauty to that wasteland. It's just different than anywhere else. The first site I do recommend going to, especially if you want to get a more of a connection with some of the Viking history that was set up there, is the National Museum of Iceland. They have great exhibits, easy to look at, lots of hands-on sort of connections. You can even try on some Viking armor if you wanted to. You get an idea of how their artwork works, lots of ornate carved horns, different metal works, a lot of great history. and. This is probably the best place to truly see some of the artifacts. They even have a nice recreation of what life would have been like for some of the original Reykjavik Vikings that were settled there, how life may have been a little bit tricky at certain points, especially on a cold winter. If you are an art lover, the, Iceland, the Reykjavik Art Museum, it's split into three locations. So the main one is down by the harbor front. And all these museums definitely are closer to the contemporary modern art. So I am not strong on art and art history and the importance of it, but I definitely know the art there, it's different in a good way. It's usually pretty bright. Some of the museums even have art that's supposed to play with your senses, whether it's sounds, different flashing objects. It's just a fun way to see how Iceland especially is dealing with their cold winters. Because again, I'm pretty sure, what can you do when it's dark at 3 o'clock? Go inside and start painting. <laughs> Paint something bright and cheery to forget what's outside. <laughs> the other museum is focused on Johannes Venson, and he is the biggest Icelandic artist name. So if you're familiar with him, he kind of deals in a contemporary impressionist style. So it would be well worth checking out his personal museum. And the third one is a little bit outside the city center, but it's the sculpture park. So if you are more into 3D style art and it's a beautiful day, there's outside areas where you can look at it and of course inside areas to look through too. So you can get a little cultured and a little art in your trip to Reykjavik. If you want a little bit more Viking history, I've always found this one to be a little bit fascinating. When I first read the name in the guidebook, Reykjavik 871 plus minus two, I thought it was a bar. Like, that totally sounds like a fancy bar. I did a little more research and discovered it's the settlement exhibit or museum. And what happened is a hotel wanted to start building in Reykjavik. And as they started construction, they found artifacts and figured out this was one of the original settlement points. And so they debated what to do, and they decided to share it. The bottom part would stay the settlement and become a museum. The top part would become a hotel. I do believe from this point, though, it's no longer a hotel above and more of an office space for the museum. But you can go in and go underneath. And it's very fascinating the fact they did not move anything. They just made it so you can see it. And you walk in and see that original settlement. They also have these great screens on the side to give you more of an idea of what Reykjavik probably looked like around that settlement. And they have more screens of artifacts and just different ways to really get connected to what it was like to have been there at that point. It comes with a combo ticket to the sagas, which is just around the corner. And these are pretty fascinating also. Pretty early in Icelandic history, they started recording the history, the family trees the best they could, and different folklore and tales, trying to describe what was going on there. And so these are fascinating to look at, and they have translated all the works into English especially the main parts of it on sort of the side next to the sagas. So you can really look at this and just see, again, read more about that folklore, read about just what people were dealing with in Iceland hundreds of years ago. If you want to get away from some of the museums, Tornin Lake or Tornin Pond, it's right in the center of Reykjavik. This is where runners get up in the morning and jog around. This is where you can watch people feed the birds. And it's a great place on one of the nicer days just to escape and feel like you're actually, again, further away from any sort of city or town. In the winter, it freezes over. And so you see people out there walking on it. I saw some kids playing soccer on the ice with surprising ease, which kind of explains 
why they're pretty good at sports in that country. If they can do it on ice, they can easily do it on grass. So <laughs> Probably the biggest icon you'll see in Reykjavik is the Sulfar Suncraft sculpture. It is a representation of a Viking longboat. It's again stylized, but it's right on the north side of the harbor. And it has some great views looking across the bay into the mountains that are just on the other side. In the summer, it's a great place to get some of the endless sunset photos. So this was at about 11 o'clock at night. And these sunsets in the summer last close to an hour and a half to two hours sometime because the sun just kind of starts skidding across the horizon for a while. So it's a wonderful place to get some of those photos if you are a photographer. The harbor is well worth spending some time in. They have some great restaurants there, and they're really building it up to be more for the tourists and less about bringing in everything. But they do have some great views of the fishing boats coming in and out. This is where you can catch boats that will either do the bay cruises, looking back at the city, or you can even connect to the whale watching or Puffin Island boats that go out. So especially in the summer, this is a good option. In the winter, there's not going to be quite as much of an option. Probably not as comfortable either, although luckily they do give you those giant, usually red coats that can keep you dry and warm. And they'll do that year round, because again, that water can, get, can be cold all year. Puffin Island is just a little bit off the coast. So you can come out here and take a look at these cute little birds flying around, maybe get some nice photos. If after you see the puffins, you are curious what they taste like, <laughs> it is on a lot of the menus too. I did try it, I'm a bit of an adventurous eater. It tasted a bit like fish. I think it's a prime example of you are what you eat sort of situation. <laughs> Usually it's combined with whale watching, and there's a lot of types of whales that will pass through very near Iceland and Reykjavik. And maybe you'll get a nice shot like this. <laughs> if you don't want to be cold, there is a museum that just opened called the Whales of Iceland. And artists have made life-size fiberglass versions of the whales that come through there. So you can go inside and stay a bit warm. The museum's a little bit expensive, but it's probably a must-see if you're traveling with children. Those are the people who come back with the biggest raving reviews about walking around, looking at the whales, you know, seeing how big they really are. And so I, I do recommend it if you're interested in whales even a little bit. It's worth the cost. Right near the harbor is also their concert hall or opera house. It, it definitely stands out compared to everything else there. Architecturally, I think it's a beautiful building. It was fun to discuss this building with some people in Reykjavik, though. And I'm sure everyone in their cities are used to hearing, why did we spend $3 billion on this? <laughs> As I said, we're, we're not really a big concert place. At least when they first built it, they weren't. They're probably bigger and bigger now with tourism. But they didn't totally understand why they needed this. But if you like architecture or you love taking photos of geometric shapes, this is the place for you. It's easy to just find a great view at every point. So I do recommend just wandering through here if you have a chance, even if it's just on the outside. I bring this up now, rather than the food section, because this is a must do according to every person in Reykjavik, if not Iceland. This is the place to get a traditional Icelandic meal. And what it is, is the Icelandic hot dog. This is where diplomats come. This is where they sent Bill Clinton when he visited. <laughs> You'll see it has huge lines every now and then. So you do want to go there and try it out. And what you're going to be eating is this. It's a hot dog made from sheep. It's going to have something that's kind of like mayonnaise. And it's going to be covered in gravy. And any person you talk to will, in Reykjavik will ask, have you tried the hot dog? Even when you come back, if your friends have been to Iceland, they'll probably say, did you try the hot dog? So if you're a meat eater, I do recommend trying to find it. The original is down by the harbor, but they have opened a few more stores throughout Reykjavik as it's gotten more and more popular. Nightlife is big in Iceland, whether it's in the summer where it's still light at 11 o'clock or in the winter where it's dark at 3 o'clock. Same idea as we talked about with art and going dark early in the winter. What's something you can do inside? You can probably start a band. So when you walk around the streets of Reykjavik at night, pretty much every bar will have some sort of live music. And as I walked down Logover Street, 
I heard things that sounded very folky, very sort of death metal rock and roll. I heard things that sounded like Japanese robots were singing in there. <laughs> so it is a wide variety for all styles. And again, the first time I went was November, and it was dark, cold, but people were out. People were surprisingly well dressed, especially girls in their short skirts and high heels. I would have been freezing personally. But don't feel like you have to do that because the other half was not dressed that way. <laughs> a lot of big bands are coming from Iceland during this sort of big musical kick. Bjork was probably the first big name from Iceland that's still around. But this one here is of Monsters and Men, which is a big band. And more and more bands are coming from Iceland of different varieties of sounds and styles. So keep your eye out on this music scene growing. And they do have one of the world's biggest festivals now in November called Iceland Airwaves. And that's a huge festival where the entire city becomes a music venue, like a, a European Woodstock almost, just right there in Reykjavik. I highlight this restaurant because they boast that they have 73 styles of Icelandic beer. Beer is an interesting story in Iceland. It was illegal until 1989. Not alcohol, just beer. You could still drink schnapps. You could drink wine. But beer was viewed as a socially corrupt drink. People just did it to be crazy and wild and destroy things. Eventually, that attitude shifted. But before it did, my guide explained that her and her friends would buy non-alcoholic beer. They would buy their favorite hard alcohol mix them, and drink them so that they felt more like they were like the people they watched on American and British TV shows that were sent up there. <laughs> she explained they were very disgusting, of course, <laughs> but it felt more like what everyone else was doing. 1989 finally came around. They decided to legalize it. And Iceland is probably one of the few places that is benefiting from global climate change because as it's warmed up, they can now grow hops and barley. And a lot of farmers have gotten very excited about this. And there are hundreds of types of Icelandic beer, it seems now. They have Viking, which can be a lot like our Bud Light. Or they have one that you see here called Lava, which is a very thick, strong beer, about 9.2% alcohol. So you have a wide variety of choices. So if you are a beer drinker, definitely give it a shot. There's a lot to choose from. They also love everything to be volcano or Viking related. So I like to just highlight this one, that this was my do not disturb sign at the hotel I stayed at. <laughs> There's a lot more you could see or do in Reykjavik, but these are the highlights I think you should try and make sure you get on your agenda, especially if you're only giving it one day. The next thing is what day trip should you do? What's the extra outside of Reykjavik thing you should see? You can see that the Blue Lagoon is pretty close to the airport. So if your flight connects decently, I would recommend trying to do it either as you land or as you leave. In the summer, the Blue Lagoon opens a little bit earlier. And if you don't mind killing an hour or so, you could go to the Blue Lagoon first. If your flight home is in the early evening, which a lot of them are, you could try and visit it before you get on your plane home. And that's how I originally visited it, is I went just before flying home, spent about two hours there, and it was the most relaxing flight home I've ever had. <laughs> But the way the Blue Lagoon was formed, as they were drilling to access the thermal vents that power a lot of their, their energy in Iceland, there was a runoff of the water, and it made this pool, this beautiful light blue color. And they discovered very quickly that it has rejuvenating minerals in it that's great for the skin. Most Reykjavik people will go to the thermal pools in Reykjavik, which actually look like just a pool. They will say you should go to the Blue Lagoon at least once because it is that different. It's nowhere else like it on the planet. The water is warm, wonderful. I went in the winter, so there was a little bit of a run between when you get outside the changing room and into the pool. But once you're in there, it's wonderful. If you're going in the summer, I highly recommend you make reservations. Make sure that you can get in at the time because it is popular. It is a little bit on the expensive side, but again, it's worth going to at least once. I highly agree with that comment. And the way it works is when you come in, they have lockers of various sizes. So if you are coming with your luggage, you can put it in a large locker. They also have everything you'd ever need to rent if you didn't bring it. Towels, swimsuits. And once you pay your entrance fee, they're going to put a bracelet on your hand, and it has a little bit of electronic reader on it. 
And so at the Blue Lagoon, there's a swim-up bar. If you want to get some beer, get some water, get some food that you can just beep your bracelet on. You can go get massages where they float you in the water and they come up behind you and start massaging you. There's saunas and everything, but be careful how much you start beeping that bracelet because <laughs> as you exit, that's where they tell you what you owe. <laughs> but just easy to wander around and I highly recommend just soak in there as much as you can because I gotta say, there was nothing like it and the scenery is beautiful around it. So just very different. People from all over the world are enjoying it, including Icelandic people too. Even on just the outside of it, you get these great looks at it. And it's amazing how quickly the water cools down. The closer you get to the thermal vent, the hotter it gets, even to a point where they warn you, don't go beyond here. And then again, just outside the Blue Lagoon, it's the same water, but now it's starting to ice over and everything. <laughs> the next big stop would be the Golden Circle. If you had to pick one big thing to do, whether this is with a tour company or with a car you rented, I do like the Golden Circle a lot and I do recommend it. You'll see you'll start in Reykjavik and you'll go north is what I'd recommend first. And as you go around, you'll first see some great scenery. This is taken about 10 minutes outside of Reykjavik. Very quickly you'll see that you are isolated again. Depending on the season you're there, the colors will be very different. So this is the winter. Here you have the summer. The greens just try and take over as much as they can with their short season. And spring, you can get a nice mix of reds, greens, browns, a little bit of everything. So you can come to Reykjavik multiple times at different seasons and get just a different look each time. The first stop will be the Thingver National Park. And this, again, is where the All Thing, that council of chiefs, would meet once a year. The lake you see here is a little interesting because it's getting shallower and shallower every year. And that's because it's also where that mid-Atlantic rift comes right through Iceland. So as they're separating, you're also then getting the lake sinking into it a little bit more. There's even a spot where you can walk through where they're split. So you can be walking through two continents right here. There's a little visitor museum there too to tell you about that council of the all thing that would meet to give you a little more history on that. But I will say most people come here to look at the nature around it and to take a look at this two continents dividing. When you've had your fun here, you'll then move on to Geyser, which is also very close to where we get our word geyser, of course. They have warning signs, follow them. The water is very, very hot. Some of the springs can even be around 200 degrees Celsius, you know, double boiling basically. So believe the signs. I know that's one issue the Icelandic Tourist Board is having with tourists right now. They don't think they have to follow signs. But the big Icon here is Geyser, which is much like Old Faithful at Yellowstone. Roughly every eight minutes, this geyser is going to erupt and you get a show. You can stand near it, you can stand back to get a view, but it's well worth stopping and looking here. I also find this is about the point where most people are ready for lunch. There is also a visitor center there where you can get a good snack, maybe a few souvenirs if you need to, but especially use the restroom while you're there. <laughs> Load up in the bus or your car again. And the next big site is Gullfoss Waterfall. This, as visually impressive as it is, it's the audio, the sound of the waterfall that makes it the most impressive in my opinion. And it's actually about four different waterfalls all in one area coming through a canyon. So you open the door of your car or walk out the bus and you hear this noise and I personally just got excited. It's like I knew this was going to be well worth it. You can walk a trail along the edge and you'll see in the winter, a lot of snow, a lot of ice going through the water. But the most iconic view of it is if you see it in the summer. There's a lot of mists that are going to be flying up in the air and make some of the best rainbow pictures you'll ever take or just get to see. You don't always have to take a picture. But same thing, you can walk around it, get a good view of everything. And I could have spent the whole day just here. But at some point, you're going to want to loop back. And as you do, you'll have some other options. I would not try and add the glacier hikes in the same day. You might need to pick one or the other or add another day. But if you've never done a glacier hike, it's well worth coming through here. Iceland makes it really easy with some of their tours. They're going to load you up with crampons that you just put right on any sort of nice hiking shoes. And they're going to give you a pickaxe. However, my guide did describe that the pickaxe is for photo opportunities. 
and more than likely I'm going to hit the person next to me with it than actually need it on the ice. <laughs> the glaciers do have this great light blue color of oxygen trapped underneath it. And I was lucky enough to go there about two years after the volcano erupted, because this glacier is on that volcano, and it was covered in soot for a good long period, but enough weather had come through and washed it off where we could actually see the glaciers again. It is like being on another planet. You'll follow your guide, you'll get these great shots of scenery, how the glacier forms. Definitely stay behind your guide though. When you see patches of snow, they could be hidden death holes, as the guide told me they were called. And what that means is you may not realize that it's a hole that goes into the glacier, that if you were to step into it, you would never be seen again. This is where your pickaxe could come in handy, maybe test any snow patch, or again, just stay behind your guide. There have been no accidents in a long time, so I don't want to scare you with it. Just keep it in mind, and again, you'll have a guide reminding you plenty, because they don't want that on them. They don't want you to disappear. <laughs> And if you're there in the winter like I was, you get the beautiful 3 p.m. sunset view. <laughs> Waterfalls are all over the place in Iceland. A lot of times they're right next to roads. Some of them are bigger that people will go out of their way to go see them. But this is one just off the main highway. It's also part of where you can do the golden circle. It comes very near this one. You can come around and walk through a lot of them. And again, some of the most impressive waterfalls. You'll see in movies lately, a lot of times that there's an interesting waterfall shot, especially if they want it to be on another planet, it was probably filmed in Iceland. Even in the winter, they're smart enough to put giant halogen lamps onto it, just lighting it up. This is about 5 p.m. in the winter, so of course you're still out exploring, but they, they lit up that waterfall just so we could all see it. So thank you for that, Iceland. <laughs> another popular option is Icelandic horses. Make sure you call it a horse. Do not call it a pony. <laughs> if you want to make someone in Iceland very angry at you, you'll call it a pony. So avoid that mistake. The ponies are, <laughs> see what I did there? <laughs> the horses are a lot of fun. There are a lot of tour groups, or organizations, or even hotels that will connect you with the ranches around the area. My fun tidbit when I was doing it in the winter is I met the guide. He explained what to do on the horses. I uh, did not grow up with horses. They do kind of make me a little nervous. But they explained to me that the Icelandic horse is a little different because it has a fifth gate. Now, I had no idea what that meant. But it was explained to me that most have four. There's a walk, there's a trot, there's the gallop, and the run. And if I got that wrong, I apologize, horse lovers. But the Icelandic horse has a fifth one where it basically does a weird shuffle. One leg comes up, presses down. Another leg comes up presses down, basically having three feet on the ground at all times, making it more sturdy on the ice. So my guide, getting us ready for the horse, introduced us to his horse named Surefoot. He told me in an Icelandic first, but said it translates to Surefoot. He got on his horse, said, follow me. We went about three minutes, and Surefoot slipped and fell on the ice. <laughs> and that made me very nervous about my horse that was not named Surefoot. But, Luckily, Surefoot was okay, the guide was okay, no one else tripped. But if you do go through the summer or the spring, you get some great chances to go around the different scenery, really connected to that rugged terrain. If you're used to horses, like some people were on the tour with me, they were allowed to go run free. They've, the guide could see that pretty quick and said, oh yeah, just, do, just take the horse out. So you'd see them running around going crazy. I kept pretty much at the walk pace. <laughs> If you're feeling really adventurous, the guide will ask if you want to go around this or through this. So I went through it. It was fun. <laughs> this is how the Northern Lights are advertised. I'm sure a lot of you have seen that. And during the winter, Iceland Air does do some great package deals on how to visit Iceland and the Northern Lights. So if you're not afraid of cold, this is a good option. Check Iceland Air's website. They again these great package deals. However, don't expect to see this. Don't go to Iceland only for the northern lights, because this is how I saw them. <laughs> I got a little bit through the cloud cover, but my guide and bus driver was amazing. They were on the radio with other companies going back and forth where one would say, I think we see a little bit of the northern lights at point such and such. And the bus would basically do this big <laughs> U-turn and just zoom trying to catch it there. And so they worked really hard. It was a 12-hour day where we got to do the glacier hike, did a, a folk museum out in the countryside. 
and the northern lights, them doing their best for me to see it. I was lucky enough that I did see the northern lights, though, and that was on my flight to Reykjavik, actually. I had a weird, weird just urge to open the shade on the plane, and I was lucky enough to be on the side looking north, and when I opened it over about Hudson Bay, you saw the purples and the greens just kind of out the window. I got really excited, woke up the kid who was sitting next to me. <laughs> the mom was a little confused at first, but once you saw why I did it, she was happy. So it's well worth hoping and going to try and see the Northern Lights, but know there's other things you should definitely put in your schedule just in case the cloud cover doesn't allow it. If you're feeling very adventurous, you can hire one of these super Jeeps they come with a driver. They don't really want you doing it on your own. Although some car rental companies will give you the option of a big 4x4 four four to go exploring. So you can really just get off all the roads. If you're in a normal rental car, do listen to these signs. <laughs> there is no insurance that's going to cover water damage. So if you try driving through a river with a Subaru Legacy, you're going to be paying for it. <laughs> it's better to let a professional in a professional vehicle kind of drive through these rivers, go over some of these giant boulders, et cetera. If you enjoy fishing, the spring and summer is a good chance. There is a lot of fishing you can do. It's usually catch and release, so don't think you're coming home with anything. But there's a lot of big fish that come through some of these streams. So good, good way to just really get connected again with nature through that area. If you're feeling even more adventurous, one of the tours that is advertise a lot, which is what I would like to do next time, is lava tube diving or snorkeling. So again, being a volcanic island, they do have these lava tubes that the lava doesn't flow through anymore, but water found a way there, and you can just start snorkeling or diving through them. Lots of interesting colors, especially in the summer and winter. So if you're a water lover, I would recommend taking a look at this. If you're a shopper, you're going to have a lot of choices to go through. I know a lot of people are. Don't tell Rick I said this. The number one souvenir that most people want to come home with is the Icelandic sweater. Unfortunately, a lot of them that you'll see at the souvenir shops are probably made in China now. These will also cost you close to $150 to $200. You can try and track down some of the handmade nice ones, but these will probably be closer to $600. You have one option that's worked for me in the past of track down the Salvation Army. Sometimes you can find some very nice donated Icelandic sweaters if you want to save a little bit of money on that. You can see it comes in a lot of varieties, but what re really makes Icelandic stand out is the style. It's usually sort of around the collar designs, kind of doing a ring shape. And so that's what makes it sort of the iconic look. And as more people are traveling to Iceland, I've been seeing it more and more in just my daily life walking around here in the United States. If you wanted anything Viking, you can find anything Viking related in these stores. <coughs> Chess sets, uh, just everything has some sort of Viking connection, if that's what you're interested in. They love to have fun with the language. There's that volcano that even with the pronunciation guide there, I have the hardest time saying. <laughs> And much like Great Britain has done with the Union Jack, you can find the Icelandic flag on everything. <laughs> that red, white, and blue really just pops on everything, too. Food can be a little tricky in Iceland. It is expensive. But they do have a strong belief in the food being fresh. They want to make sure that you get fish that's no more than a day old. More likely it was caught that morning. And so a meal, if you go to a sort of standard restaurant, can easily cost you about $40 per person. That can add up pretty quick. But there are options to save money. And so this first one I'm showing is Icelandic fish and chips, pretty close to the harbor. You can get, basically it's their random fish of the day. If you don't care what kind of fish you're eating, for between $10 and $12, you can get fish and chips. So pretty close to US prices on that. And it was delicious. If you wanted to get a specific fish or have it baked, or have it uh, grilled, then there's some options to pay a little bit more for these two. So you get your options here. They do cost a little bit more. When you're at restaurants, I would recommend trying the Rugbrod. This is a very, very hearty bread. And it was explained to me that it used to be cooked in the thermal vents in Iceland. They'd wrap it in a special wax, 
the dough and then just dip it right into the thermal vent and it would cook. They don't really do it that way anymore, but the recipe is the same. And I did find if you just take a, one of these slices that you see here, slap some butter on it, that could easily be your lunch. Like it was very filling, thick, hearty bread. So I can see how the Vikings were probably taking a loaf of that out when they went out fishing or pillaging. And that could have been their whole meal for the month. <laughs> Hakarl, this is for all you adventurous eaters. The correct way to describe it is putrefied shark. Putrefied is the correct word, so it is going bad. If you order it, be prepared to maybe not want to eat a lot unless you have a very interesting taste palette. But they'll bring it out, just one of these cubes on a little toothpick. That was more than enough for me. I'm glad I tried it. I don't need to do it again. <laughs> but if you want to be adventurous, give it a shot. I, I do recommend this is your chance to do it easily. <laughs> Going along with that sort of brave tasting of foods, very popular item in Iceland is the Icelandic schnapps. And it is grown and made from the seeds of a moss that grows on the lava. So if that sounds delicious to you, you're on the right track. <laughs> but with this schnapps, there are many brands that were made, but the two sort of types I noticed was a brown kind and the green kind you see here. The brown kind tasted a little bit like dirt, is kind of the best way to put it. And the green kind, the closest I can equate it to is maybe what death would probably taste like. <laughs> it was strong. But I was lucky enough that the first time I went to Reykjavik, it was graduation night at one of the universities. And I got to chat with some of the university students. And they asked, have you tried it? And I said, yeah, I tried one. It wasn't very good. Well, each of these students had their own favorite brand of it and they would buy me shots of it. And so I tried many versions, and they all ended pretty much the same way of me going, mm. <laughs> But another thing that's well worth trying to say you did it. So Iceland is definitely a place of extremes. The nature is like nowhere else on the planet. The food, the culture, everything is definitely hearty, and you can see its traditions from the Vikings who settled there. So I just like to say, if you're going, have a great trip. I think you're going to love it as much as me and the millions of other people who are starting to discover it right now. It's well worth your time. Again, it easily could be its own visit. But if you're on your way to Paris or Rome and you have some time to give and you're going through Reykjavik anyways, I highly recommend it. Thank you very much. <laughs>